Great recording. Okay. Um, my name is Mirka Donastorg, and I am interviewing Kevin Hanau. Is that how you pronounce it? Hanau, or in, in Spanish you can say Hanau. Hanau. But you can just say Hanau, since it's easier. Okay. My name is Mirka Donastorg, and I am interviewing Kevin Hanau for Lila Buha's Beaford Highway Oral History Project. The date is June 3rd, 2018, and the interview is taking place at the Globe Hub. So you were born in Brooklyn. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. How long did you live in Brooklyn? Uh, we lived in New York for about three years. And then? Well, I moved to Atlanta. Okay, from Brooklyn. Yeah. And how long were you in Atlanta? Um, Atlanta pretty much my whole life, other than when I was about 21, 22, I moved to Miami and lived in Miami for 14 years. Okay. And where is where your family from? My family is originally from Colombia. Where? Uh, Pereira, which is the coffee axis region of the world. So the richest coffee, uh, where most of the production comes from, is from our region. It's a smaller city, probably population 1.5 million. Um, some of the other cities are bigger, um, but that's where my parents are from. Okay, and when did they move to the U.S.? Um, they migrated to New York City back in 1969, originally. And what did they do in Colombia? Um, in Colombia, they were just getting started. So when they moved to New York City, um, my father started working in the textile industry as a pattern maker, and my mother was just like a stay-at-home mom, and they met in New York City. Okay, so they met there. Yeah. And uh, what did they do in Colombia? In Colombia, they just... Um, my father came shortly after high school. He migrated here, which is kind of neat because back then, I, I want to say, it's always taken a lot of courage to you know, get up and, and move to a different country, and you see it a lot now, but in 1969, in that time, that wasn't that popular. You know what I mean? It was kind of like you stayed where you were born and grew up in. So it definitely took a lot of courage for him to... Um, you know, to come over, but, you know, we're all grateful that he did. So why did they decide to come over? When or why? 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 Um, from what I've asked my father, he just wanted to, um, you know, discover a new world, you know, so um, I think there was maybe like one, one other um, uncle that was in New York, and then um, he just decided to come along. And your mom? My mom, same thing. Um, she had another relative that was living in New York, and she just decided to come as well. So it was just kind of like what some people were doing. You know, I guess people that are thinking outside of the box, um, you know, typically that's what happens. You know, when somebody wants to move somewhere, somewhere else than where they're from, I feel that it requires a certain type of, you know, mental mentality. Okay. And so... I do. I have one sister. Her name is Karen, and she lives in Swanee. Is she older? Or younger? She's older. She's five years older than me. Okay. And so, why did you guys move to Atlanta? I think my parents, um, although they love New York City, um, felt that they wanted to give us a better upbringing. Um, and Georgia back then, I mean, the Atlanta, the population was only about a million, and we were probably one of the few Latinos that were in the city then, because it was a small number of, you know, in comparison to what it is now. It's drastically changed, but I think it was more of, um, you know, typically when, when New Yorkers move down, is just there's just more space. Um, there uh, seems to be a better quality of life um, than, you know, being cramped up in a small, you know, apartment. Although I love, you know, New York City and, you know, the whole landscape and how people live, but for them, I think they just wanted to give us a better upbringing. Okay. So you said that you're one of the few Latinos in Atlanta when you first Yes. What um, was that like? Well, I was, I was a very young age, but I remember... Um, being here and there being a small population of Colombians, some Mexicans, some Cubans, and some Puerto Ricans. That really was, at least what I saw back then, what that landscape looked like. Um, how was it? Uh, I mean, we grew up right off of Buford Highway, off of Oak Cliff Road, and back then, um, 
you, the Buford Highway was becoming a little diverse, but it was still very much white. Um, you know, you would walk into a store like my mother, you know, she doesn't speak English that good. So I would find myself translating for her, you know, at a very young age. You know, now you could walk into any business on Buford Highway and, you know, probably speak whatever language and there'll be somebody there to uh, respond back to you in that language. So we, we first moved to the Shallerford Arms Apartments, which I think they're now putting a school there, um, which is r kind of right off of, you know, Buford Highway. Um, I, I consider Buford Highway anything kind of like, you know, off of it as well. I don't know what you guys, um, how you guys look at it, but I'm sure I'm probably very similar. So I think it was just um, Dorville and Shambly, um, had that feel of that transitioning feel where um, I think it was not super expensive. It was kind of where some Latinos were starting to hover. So typically that's what you'll find, you know, when somebody, you know, immigrates to a certain country, they always try to find, you know, some type of, you know, security and, and, and warmth. And I think my parents kind of found this area to be that. So I don't think it was, you know, for any other reason other than, you know, just, um, you know, proximity of, of, of our people. And what years were those? That was in uh, 1979, so it was like 79 through the 80s and 90s. Okay. And you went to school uh, around the Yeah, I went, I, went to, I went to elementary school at Oak Cliff Elementary which is, um, you know, in the heart of, in the heart of Doraville. Um, then I went to Sequoia. I, uh, back then it was a middle school. I'm not sure what it is now. And then ultimately I went to Krosky's High School, which we all know is a huge, you know, melting pot of different phases. What's one of, like, key traits that you The one line will play world. So a lot of people don't know this. Well, um, they do. I guess people who grew up in the area would know. So there was a line will play world in front of Baldino's, where Baldino's sub shop is right now. Um, I think it's now an old warehouse. I think there was a soccer field there at one point in time. But that was a, uh, line will play world was a, uh, like a Toys R Us you know, for, I don't know, 70s, 80s. And it was, you know, amazing because it was, you know, toys and toys and toys and toys. Um, and it would just be cool just to go there and like, I mean, sometimes, you know, they wouldn't buy anything for us, but it was still good to go and check it out. So that's really one of my big, I mean, there's, there's a lot, you know, to mention, but I would say the one that stands out the most would be that because it was, it was there. You didn't have to drive out to you know, the suburbs of where, like, the malls are to find a big toy store. We had it right then and there. Okay. They ultimately went out of business, but... <laughs> um, no, it was a, I believe it was a national um, franchise, and, um, I mean, it had a great variety of toys, you know, and, you know, at those ages, you know, it's like what, I guess, Toys R Us is now, but I guess they're kind of going out of business as well, so... That's true. <laughs> It was self-contained. So we had um, right down the street where Doraville Plaza is, where the Chick-fil-A is, and the Wells Fargo, we had a, um, a supermarket called Big Star. Um, and, and I believe I have some of these names correct. You know, maybe I'm off with the names, but there was a Rich Way, which Rich Way eventually became Target. Um, so that's where the Burlington is right now. And um, there was all types of little shops. There was a Radio Shack in that plaza. There was um, a couple other different shops, like your local photo store um, and like different businesses. And um, there was a Kmart down the street, which was absolutely awesome. Um, and then we also had in front of that Kmart where the Buford Highway Farmer's Market is, we had 
um, a big box retailer called uh, the uh, Discount Something Drugs, but it was like a huge, huge, um, um, like a Walmart type. So there was plenty. Like we would literally jump in the car with my mom or my dad, and we would literally have it all within two, three minutes. Yeah. We also had a movie theater, which a lot of people remember, um, that grew up around that time, um, that the movies were $1.25, and it was right behind our apartment complex. And uh, I think it was actually a dollar. And uh, we also had a movie theater right then and there, you know, as well. So we, we kind of had, you know, everything. Do you remember what the movie theater was? Uh, I'm not sure, but if you go back to that area, um, it looks like it's still a movie theater. I'm not sure exactly what they have there, but you know, it might have the original name. I'm not sure. I pass by sometimes just going down Beaufort Highway, but I can't recall the name. But it was like they would bring, they wouldn't bring out the brand brand new movies, but they would bring out like, you know, once movies were in a movie theater for, you know, two, three months, then that movie theater would get them. So it was kind of like lower budget, you know, style. So after you went to High school. Mm -hmm. you went to college at yeah, so I was at Krosky's High School, and um, I mean, I was always a, I would call myself a CB student, um, kind of had a hard time focusing just because my mind was, you know, you know, always, you know, exploring and racing and all that. Um, and then I was was able to get a full paid scholarship through the Hope Scholarship, which at that time was probably in its, I don't know, second year, third year. It was kind of new. But as I was, I was able to get a Hope Scholarship on a pretty low uh, GPA, but, um, you know, they, I was awarded one. You know, I don't know if I wrote a good essay or what happened, but I, I, I think it also helped, you know, that I was a minority. I think that may have helped. Um, but I was awarded a full page scholarship to Georgia State University. Um, well, I applied to Georgia State and was accepted. And then probably after like two or three months, I was just like, I just wanted to do my own thing. I just couldn't focus. So around that time, I, I was in college. I was working at a computer company um, in, in Norcross, and I uh, ultimately, I just ended up quitting school. I just came home one day, and I walked, I remember, I walked into our apartment, and I told my mom, I said, hey, I don't want to go to college anymore. And she kind of looked at me, and she was kind of like, I could tell she was a little disappointed, but she just kind of told me, okay, you know what I mean? It was kind of like, um, she knew I was kind of set in my ways and um, she, you know, there wasn't really a lot of um, resistance, you know, it was just kind of like, she was like, okay, and I was like, okay. So then I, I was working at a, a computer company. I ended up getting fired from that computer company for some stupid. And uh, I was grateful that I was fired because I then um, started working in the car business. And I can tell you if, you know, if anybody knows anybody that's worked in the car business or has worked in the car business selling cars, it's one of the greatest schools there ever can be just because it teaches you so much about people, personalities, emotions, um, and it really builds up a lot of, um, you know, it's like you get a lot of rejection, so it builds a lot of character. And I, I want to say that was one of the jobs, at least for me, that helped forge um, my character and you know, you know, my knack for business and, and negotiating. Okay, so what year did you enter school? So I, I graduated high school in 1996 from Cross Keys. And um, I would say three, three, four months later, I was in, I was in school. You know, I was commuting to Georgia State, which, you know, like I don't know. I think commuting to school is different than like the on-campus experience, which the on-campus experience is probably maybe much better. You know, um, that's one of the things that I kind of like go back on and I say to myself, you know. Maybe I'd still be in school if I was maybe living on campus. You know, I don't know. Did you find that when you were talking to your classmates and they asked where you were from, um, did they know Beaufort Highway if they were from Alabama? 
you know what? We, I, I really didn't interact with a lot of, we, so at Georgia State, the, the, I guess the Hispanics or Latinos would um, kind of gather around like in a little area. And it was maybe like 20 of us, 25 of us. But I, I, I don't even recall if there was a lot of conversations just in general, you know? It was just kind of like going to school, kind of discovering that whole process figuring that out and then it was just kind of like um i really don't have a, like a ton of ton of memories you know as far as like you know making new i definitely didn't make any new friends um, there it was just more of like some people we already knew kind of scenario and then i was out in a flash and so then you go to the, into the auto business um i i worked there for about um i was like there for about two years yeah, yeah, and, and that, and like when I first started, I I think I took a good knack. I, my, my first month in the car business, I sold 16 cars. So for me, it was like I felt that I was a natural, and I really liked it. Um, of course, now I hate it, and probably be one of the last things I would want to do. But at the time, you know, it was great. It was teaching me a lot. Now I was starting to make a lot more money, and um, you know, I was having fun and, and learning a, a new trade. And so, do you think? Yeah, absolutely. It was more so, you know, to tie in um, this next chapter of my life, which is Miami. I, I had visited Miami in 98. I was actually not even going to go on a trip. It was a whole bunch of buddies that were going to Miami. They were going for the new year. And I was like, you know what? I'm not trying to go down and and, and drink and, and party. I want to start the new, new year like focused. You know what I mean? I wanted to start off on the right foot. So I was very hesitant to going, but then I ended up just like, ah, you know what, screw it, I'm gonna go. And back then, um, Value Jet, which is what, uh, what airline? Um, it's a big airline from Atlanta, I forget the name. They had something called a Buddy Pass. Um, isn't there an airline called Air Trans or Transair? I don't know. It was in Atlanta. It was a, an Atlanta-based uh, um, airline company, and they had something called the Buddy Buddy Pass or something like that, which for like thirty-nine dollars you could just like fly standby. You know, so you would go to the airport, pick where you're going on that airline, and like if you could get on, you would get on for thirty-nine dollars. So uh, we we were able to catch a flight to Miami, and I had some other friends there, and. Um, when I got to Miami, uh, I was there for three or four days, and uh, I fell in love. I, I knew the the city, the, that city is where I wanted to be. I feel I felt excuse me. I felt like Atlanta was 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 growing. You know, we just had the Olympics, but I kind of felt that it was still n not grown up yet. So I felt that I needed more action, bigger city, and I think Miami offered you know, a lot to me. So I literally walked into the door when I got back in. I saw my mom and I said, I'm moving, I said, mom, uh, we're moving to Miami. She looked at me kind of crazy. And then um, seven or eight months later, I moved to Miami. And so you said Yeah, no. So my, my dad, uh, you know, my dad has always been very on board with pretty much anything that I kind of come across. You know, he's extremely, both of my parents are extremely supportive uh, of, of my ideas. My mom is always a little more hesitant, a little more skeptical in a lot of my uh, ideas and, and, and craziness, you know, sometimes. But my dad is, is always um, supportive 100%, almost like, you know, blindly, you know, so he was on board too. He was like, yeah, you know, that'd be cool. So he ended up leaving first and then I moved down and then eventually my mother moved down. My sister stayed because she ended up getting married and she stayed in living here in, in Atlanta, but, uh, we all ended up just moving down to Miami. Okay. And what did your parents do? So my mom continued to be stay at home mom and my dad continued working in the, uh, as a pattern maker in the textile industry. Um, everywhere he went, he did that in New York. He did that in Atlanta, in Chambly, um, at a kid's um, clothing company. And then he did that in Miami as well. So it's kind of like a trade that if you know, if you're good at it, you know, you're typically gonna find, you know, a job anywhere. However, I will say that 
now that industry, most everything is being made, you know, elsewhere, you know? Mm -hmm. You don't see a lot of it here. So I was, I want to say I was like 22, 23. And when I got there, I started working in the car business, which I hated there. So I loved it in Atlanta, but in Miami, it was different. It had a very different feel. It had a very unstable feel. Um, it was just like, you know, unstable. unstable. And I felt that less money, not enough clients, the quality of dealerships wasn't the same in what I found here. Um, it just felt different and it felt more insecure. And maybe it's because when I was working here, I was working for the Troncali Group, which is a very big family owned um, style car dealerships. You know, I worked at a Nissan store, but they had a bunch of different brands and it was started by the father and then the son took over. So it, it had a, a really good feel to it. But in Miami, I worked at a couple of different dealerships and I never really kind of felt, um, you know, secure. Was it trying to No, they were in Decatur. I worked off Church Street, um, but they had, um, they had dealerships everywhere, you know, for the most part. In Miami, so I only, my, 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 my first Miami episode only lasted one year. Why? Because I started, um, I started partying, um, not, not anything bad or anything like that. You know, it's just Miami offers a lot of nightlife. And um, so we, we just, we started having a lot of fun. I ended up um, uh, meeting a girl. I ended up kind of having one of my first like heartbreaks. And it was just kind of, I started getting into debt. And we also started, uh, you know, promoting some parties. We ended up losing some money, me, me and one of my buddies. So Miami just became kind of like, a pressure cooker of sorts where it was just like I need to get I need to get out of here and I need to go back and regroup so I wanted to leave with the intention of coming back so I phoned up my ex uh, boss um, Sean Azadnia which he was the general man he's still I think in the car business um, and he loved me and I loved him um, you know we had a good relationship and you know, I called him back and I said, hey, um, you know, will you take me back if I come back? And he was like, yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, back in Atlanta, back at the dealership. He was like, hey, we have another guy that speaks Spanish here. He's from Ecuador, but, you know, we can have two Spanish speakers. And I was like, I don't care. So when I got back, um, I ended up becoming really close friends, and we're still very close to this day with, with Javier, um, who, you know, had my old position. Yeah, Ecuadorian. And, um, you know, him and I became good friends. So it wasn't kind of like, hey, you stole my position, none of that. So um, I started working back at the dealership. With, and my mother was still here. My dad stayed. So my idea was to maybe work hard for one year, go back to Miami. But now I knew what I was facing. You know, I knew the city. I knew the landscape. And um, that's pretty much what I did. No, she stayed. She always stayed. She never, she never had left, which was kind of smart that she stayed. Yeah, she just kind of stayed, you know what I mean? And uh, uh, it was kind of smart, um, but came back to Atlanta, worked for a year, got out of debt, did all that, and then literally packed everything up again and then headed out, back down. My, yeah, my dad stayed in Miami. Okay. Yeah. And then back, back to Miami. So when I was in Miami, so this is the second chapter, which lasted 14 years, I, or 13 years, um, I started working in the car business, again, very short period of time, but then I answered an ad um, for like a recruiting company or something, and I ended up getting placed at a Fortune 50 company um, making excellent pay, and um, that was a great start, you know, to um, 
not my entrepreneurial, but my just my career. It was a Fortune 50 company. I was working in the financial services sector as an account executive, and um, that job taught me a lot as well. But that kind of that's what kind of where I started getting rounded, as um, you know, just my 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 worth ethic, my career. It was it was a good place for me. I was with them for about two years. So from there, my best friend, Cesar Morales, whose mother owns Las Americas, which is one of the oldest, um, it's still a store, but they also sell Colombian food, like more like fast food. And they're located um, right off of Buford Highway. They've been around for probably, I don't know, 30 something years. 37 years, 35 years. Um, so uh, Caesar, Caesar, my best friend, moved to Miami. And then Caesar was more of an entrepreneur because he grew up in that whole entrepreneurial world. Um, and he came up with the idea while I was working at the finance companies. He said, hey, why don't we open up a cafe? And I was like, okay, cool. He was like, look, you put up the money and I'll run it. And I was like, okay, cool. I was like, look, I don't have the money liquid, but I have credit. And, and I was like, how much is it going to be? He was like $35,000. I was like, wow, you know, that's a lot of money. Um, so I said, okay, look, I'll figure it out. So I pretty much was able to, like, get some credit cards, you know, some loans. And we jumped into business together. But that business ended up, we, we had picked a location in Coconut Grove, and that location was taking too long to open up, but we were still gonna do that there, but we decided then to open up another place at the same time. So we were gonna be like the king, we were like two kids from Atlanta. Um, you know, we moved to Miami, um, amazing nightlife, you know, beautiful women, the energy, the vibe, and we were like, you know, we're going to be the kings of, you know, Coconut Grove. You know, Coconut Grove is an area of Miami. And um, so we decided to jump into a restaurant. So we were going to do, we were going to have a restaurant, and then we were going to have, like, th this bar. And um, we ended up investing over $550,000. And I ended up putting up all of my credit, my mother's credit, my dad's credit, and like we went all in. And it was something that, you know, I wanna say we were like destined for failure just because of how ex our rent was like 18,000 a month, which for inflation, you know, could be, you know, this was back in 2001. I don't know, it could be the equivalent of a, $25,000 rent now, I don't know. Um, so we just jumped all in. We came out with something cool, we opened up something cool, but we were just clueless on the financial aspect of it, the numbers, you know, we were selling a lot, but we also had crazy expenses, and eventually it just ended up folding after like two or three months. You know, we opened around the time, we were in the middle of construction, getting ready, well, not in the middle, toward the end of construction, getting ready to open up, and then September 11th happens, and then you just kind of knew that there was, you know, like something in the air where it was like, you know, hey, you know, tourism is going to dip, there's a lot of uncertainty. I mean, I don't care if tourism would have been good, we still would have failed anyways, but it just kind of added to the whole, you know, mix of things, you know. So after three or four months, we ended up going bankrupt. And what was that? That was, um, that was my Harvard, you know. So like I mentioned before, I didn't go to college. Um, but this was my college, you know. Um, I learned so much. Learned so much about business. Learned so much about stress, about pressure, about bills, about finances, about people. Um, you name it. And, and that, for me, I can honestly say that re really, really, really helped, 
you know, forge me as well, you know. So for me, um, that was really my, my Harvard, you know. It was my, my, where I got, you know, so much experience, you know. And then the other place that we already had secured as well, too, that ended up kind of going down the drain as well. But there was a lot that I had to face. There was a lot of uncertainty going through that, um, you know, scary times because there's no source of income. You got a lot of, you know, there was a lot of, you know, a lot of debt, and a lot of pressure coming every which way. And um, I've always been very resilient and very strong. Um, I got to the point where um, the pressure broke us, you know, and it was just kind of like literally, um, you know, talking to my parents, you know, I literally, you know, started crying. And uh, it was just, you know, short, you know, it wasn't like, you know, long. And it was, they, they were very reassuring. They're like, look, who cares, you know, you, you can get through this. You messed up your credit, you messed up our, our credit, but... You know, it is what it is, and it's all good. So right then and there, I said, you know what? Uh, you know, I just dusted myself off, and I made it a purpose to continue to hang out in that area because I didn't want to, like, hide from anybody. I didn't want to, you know, just kind of like, you know, some people are embarrassed when something happens like that. You know, I was out, you know, the next couple of nights, at some other places, kind of just like very normal. People ask me, hey, what happened? And I'll just tell them, hey, you know, we, you know, we were clueless or, you know, I think that's what I told them. I said, hey, we were, you know, we didn't really know what we were, you know, into. So um, um, shortly after that, um, I knew that I had to work hard to get out of the hole. So I started working at a mortgage company. A, a friend of mine had a mortgage company and um, I got back into that business, you know, I, but I just as an employee. And you and Caesar, do you guys Oh yeah, so very good question. We were best friends, well, my parents and his parents, good friends. Um, you know, my dad has carried him when he was a child and, and vice versa. We, we, for a long time, we, we hadn't connected. And then when we were like 12, we had connected. And from like 12 or 13 on, we were like best friends. As a result of the restaurant, we weren't, there was some fighting going on, but not a lot. Um, he ended up um, finding some extra money from somebody else and decided he wanted to open up another place where we were, um, which he ended up losing him another probably sixty, seventy thousand dollars because that flopped as well. So, you know, I I, I had called him and and um, you know I texted him or called him and you know he didn't answer. I called him again and then I was like he didn't call me back. So I was just kind of like, okay, maybe he doesn't want to talk. But there was I don't think there was anything that anybody did you know, to cause um, us to not be friends anymore for that time. So it was, it lasted probably like, um, um, probably like, I think he ended up moving back to Atlanta. It was probably like a year, year and a half. Not at all. And, it, and I guess maybe he, the way he dealt with it was just kind of like, look, I just, you know, I want to check out whatever I was going through. You know, and I respected that. But after, after like a year and a half, um, he called me. And, you know, I got that phone call from him and it was like, and, and, I, and I, at one point in time I was, you know, I was a little hurt just because it was like, okay, cool. Like, you know, what happened or, you know what I mean? Like, you need some, whatever it may be. But I gave him a space. He called me. We started talking and then um, we met up. He had moved back to Miami. We met up and it was like, we're best friends again. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was just like nothing happened. We really never talked about like, hey, why did we start? Why, why did we not talk for, you know, a year? It was just kind of like we picked up where the relationship had left off, which was best friends. And, you know, to this day, we'll, we, you know, he's, he's, he's got some very successful um, um, nightlife ventures in, in Miami. And, um, you know, we still, you know, talk, you know, you know, several times a day, you know. <laughs> yeah. So you get back into the mortgage business. Mm -hmm. um, what was that like after going through the starting of these businesses, bankruptcy? Yep. Did you approach business in a different way? Yeah, absolutely. I, I want to say that, first of all, when your back is against the wall, you you operate a little different. You operate differently than anybody else because there's a sense of urgency. You're extremely focused. 
and um, you kind of are in like a no excuse type uh, mentality. So I found myself um, determined to, to get back, to get back on my feet, to get out of you know, my financial ruin. And I started working in the mortgage business. This was like 2002, 2003, and it was starting to heat up, heat up in a good way, like it was starting to, to get busy. So I met uh, another Colombian, um, named Mauricio, um, who, or Maui, who, you know, we became friends at the mortgage company we were working at. And then we were like, you know what? We weren't too happy with, with our buddy's company where we were working at. And we were like, you know what, man, let's just open up our own mortgage company. He was like, all right, cool. You know, he was like, look, I'll put up, he, he told me, he was like, look, I'll put up like 10 grand or whatever. We'll own it together and let's do it. So we decided to do that. And we, we formed a company called Absolute Lending Group. And, um, we just started rocking and rolling. And then it was like, all of a sudden I found myself like making real good money and then paying some of the, some of the debt that I, I mean, I ended up filing for, for bankruptcy protection, all that, but there were some things that didn't go away that I had to pay. So I kind of got out of the hole and next thing you know, um, you know, we're rocking and rolling, we're hiring people, you know, the mortgage industry and real estate is on fire, you know, in, in South Florida and most of the United States. Um, you know, it was, it was very easy to make very good money or a lot of money in those days. So um, I want to say we had a good run from like 2003 to 2007, 2000, yeah, like 2007. No, no. Why? Because our rent was cheap, paying eight hundred dollars a month or something. Um, it wasn't in. A, it wasn't a company that required huge overhead. So one of the things that I can just recommend in business is always start lean. You know, don't go and get the most expensive. You know office, uh, you know, hire a ton of people, you know, always stay lean. And when you stay lean, you can undo a mess. If things get tough, you can undo that. But when you're, you know, huge payroll, you know, huge space, you know, huge rents, then it's like, if something goes wrong, you might, you can't even survive a month, you know? So I was never scared because obviously of what I had faced. And this was easy to me. It was small, it was manageable, and we just started making, you know, you know, we just started making a lot of money. And so for 2003, 2007, why did it start to... Okay, so the, the recession or what, I think they called it a recession. Um, Yeah, pretty much the economy went bust and, 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 2008, especially that industry. That industry was the housing crash or bubble that exploded was the, was what caused all the problems with everybody, with, you know, jobs, you you name it. So we had felt it, and we felt something was weird. We didn't know what it was. It's almost like you're chilling in your backyard and the weather starts to change. You feel a little wind, but you don't know if a storm is coming. You don't know what's coming. So we felt something. We didn't know what it was because we weren't savvy enough. And, and most people, I mean, there was a couple experts on Wall Street that like knew exactly what was going on. But, you know, the whole, nobody knew. When did you feel that? We started feeling that in 2007 smell we just knew something was going on and luckily for us we had done a pivot in our business and we started offering reverse mortgages which caters to seniors it's government backed and we were doing infomercials so we were able to pivot and by us being able to do that pivot we were able to buy ourselves an extra year everybody else that we knew that had mortgage companies and everything everybody was going out of business going out of business but we managed to hang on for one more year because we did a pivot we did something that other people weren't doing luckily um but all it did was buy us an extra year you know what i mean um and then um all hell broke loose um at this time i 
want to say we didn't see it coming. We, everything wasn't in my name at that point in time. It was in my business partner's name. So even a loft that I had bought, it was in his name. Um, so it was kind of like a situation where everybody was upside down in their mortgages. You know, properties were worth less than half of what maybe they were mortgaged out for or whatever. So then we just kind of braced ourselves for that storm. And it was like, okay, what do we do? So everything was cool. And my business partner is like, look, um, everything is in my name, you know, you know, like he knew what was going to happen. And the funny thing is, is that I was that same person to Caesar because back when I took the hit for, for a restaurant in Coconut Grove restaurant lounge, I was the person that my name was on the line. So then it's kind of like, you know, I think everything comes back. You know, um, you know, you put yourself in a certain position one time and the next time you don't, somebody else is kind of taking that hit. And, um, you know, my, my business partner, Maui, he, he took it in stride and we, we still continued to remain close. And we, we, we had another concept around that time that I had created called Credit Life. And what Credit Life was, was a... Um, a financial literacy kit that taught people how to establish credit or reestablish credit, how to buy a house, how to buy a car. And I created that kit when we had the mortgage company. We hadn't launched it, but it was a very good business idea because the kit would allow you, we, we had set up a finance company that would allow you to finance the kit as well, thus reestablishing credit. So we set a financial company on the side. We had this company that was pretty much like an intellectual property company. It was educational. It was an educational tool. So we, we, we never launched it, but as we have the mortgage company and as stuff is getting a little weird, yeah. The weirdness was it that all of a sudden the people aren't paying back their mm-hmm. and Yeah. So, no, what we saw was crazy loans happening. I'll give you an example. You have a 580 credit score, which is bad credit. And you there was loans that we could finance you 100% and you could state your income. You could tell me, hey, I make, I work for, you know, I work cutting grass and I make $12,000 a month. Okay, put that on the application, send it in, it's approved, here's 100%. So we were seeing a lot of weird things happening, but we didn't know any better because, you know, we're not, the, we're not the banks. The banks are saying, hey, sell this. And they're pushing us to sell this. You know, they're incentivizing us to sell this. So we're just kind of like, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, exactly. They didn't give us the loans. They gave them directly to the people, but we were pushing the loans. So we were kind of part of the problem too, but we didn't know that we were part of the problem because we didn't know any better. All we knew was we were getting paid a lot of money to do these loans. So we felt something weird was going on. Um, And then, so I've always been of one to, uh, I'm a serial entrepreneur. And I hate to use that word because I know a lot of people use it, but you know, uh, I, I think most entrepreneurs they like to have different businesses. I'm doing a little better now with not trying to be like, have my hands in a million things, a little more focused now, more conscious of it. But I started two companies while at the mortgage company. One of them was a company called couplewisdom.com, which would send motivational quotes to cell phone users. Um, It was a startup. Um, It never really did anything major, but I started it then with my business partner and then um, Credit Life as well. So there was like two companies that we had while this company was going on and, you know, we put money into it. But the Credit Life, I was able to put a listing out for it saying, hey, we needed an investor. And I got a call on a Friday night and it was a guy with a very um, heavy British accent uh, a guy named by the name of, of Paul Stanley, who's um, a good friend of ours. And, you know, I, I said, hey, I have this this kit. And he was like, tell me more about it. And I was like, he was like, look, man, I know what you're trying to do because 
He's like, I own 15 restaurants and I went bankrupt and I ruined my credit. So like right then and there, I knew I was like, man, this is the guy. This is going to be our business partner for this new venture. Although we still had the mortgage company. So he was like, look, come see me. I live in Palm Beach. Here's your address. Can you come see me next week? I said, cool. So I went up there and I got to his house, really nice house, and um, started talking to him. And he was like, um, he said to me, um, I explained to him what the what the company was about, and he was like, this is amazing. He was like, look, I'll tell you this. He was like, look, Kevin, I don't know if I'm going to invest in this, but I will tell you one thing. You and me are going to do something together. He was like, I love your energy. I love, you know, you know how you are. And I was like, cool. And I just let it be, and, like, we started negotiating, and, like, I don't know, like two, three weeks later, they ended up investing like $275,000. But it almost didn't happen because his business partner was getting scared of what was starting to happen because now there was stuff in the news. Now there was like, hey, you know, the economy. And I, I was able to save the deal in a parking lot, like in a Dunkin' Donuts parking lot with a business partner. And I was like, Andy, I'm like, hey, you know what I mean? Like, um, you know, this is going to be a great company. Like the whole pitch, you know what I mean? Because it was on the fence. So we were able to close it. And then Paul wanted to us to kind of put Credit Life on a hold and focus more on the reverse mortgages. So I don't know to this day if he just saw reverse mortgages. I don't know if he saw investing in this other company as a way to get in with us, because ultimately they just ended up becoming our partners in the companies. And then uh, we, we continued pushing the reverse mortgages, doing all that, and then um, and then like the, the bottom started falling out. Yeah, then that was it. So now we were... Where did you... One quick question. Yeah. Where did you put a listing out for an investor? Like, what is the forum for the... Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So here's a creative way. So there's websites called, like, Biz Buy Sell. And all I did was... It's kind of weird because typically those are, like, established businesses. Hey, I have a dry cleaner. I've had it for 10 years. You know, it, you know, sells $700,000 worth, you know. This was a concept. But... I know that if somebody, my, my thought process, it's very hard to find an investor on an unproven model, you know? If you, if you really analyze, if somebody's searching to buy a business or invest in a business, they might be trying to buy an existing business. So I just kind of like snuck my listing in there, which is legal, it's not illegal. Um, and whatever i had whatever i had there um as a listing intrigued them and just it's a numbers game you know what i mean if you can tell your story to enough people you know eventually you'll probably find somebody that will believe in in your cause and want to be a part of it one way or another um so that's how i was able to to make that happen but um it was I want to say we only had a couple phone calls on it, so it was a pretty good closing ratio, you know what I mean, that, you know, it happened. So I was able to save the deal uh, with the partner. They came in, and then, you know, eventually the bottom fell out, um, and then it was like, oh, crap, you know, what are we going to do now? So 2008, and it was- So now it's, yeah, now it's like 2008. So 2008, 2009, so... Our business partner, Paul, was had met another gentleman in Palm Beach that was in the life insurance business. So at that point in time, we still had a little bit of a mortgage operation, but we were like, okay, we're going to get into life insurance because it's like, I mean, you're, you're licensed to do mortgages. You're kind of working in that whole financial arena, you know, life insurance, annuities, it's very similar, so it didn't require a lot. So we ended, licensed? yeah, we ended up getting licensed. We we already had mortgage licenses, but we didn't have this license. So we ended up getting license licenses, and we started as the mortgage companies going down and closing down. We started the we we got into life insurance, and life insurance, as we all know, is great. Um, it's pretty stable. 
and the commissions can be very good. It's hard to do. It's not easy to do, but we got into that and um, we just, we, we started in that business. So it was kind of like, um, you know, because we had Paul, you know, Paul was in our life and we kind of transitioned into that, you know? Okay. Uh, so this is still Miami. Yeah, it's still Miami. What does it feel like when you open a business? Like what's the, is it a rush? Is it a yeah. Thing? So for me, it's, um, I want to say it's hope. It's the first thing. Because anybody that opens up a, a business, it's typically, it's, you know, there's a dream, you know, whether it be financial, whether it be to impact, whatever it may be. So it's, it's, it's almost like it's hope. There, you know, it's hope at the end of, you know, the, the, the tunnel or, or down the road. So um, it all starts with that. You know, you, you, you see something and you see the goal and you're like, okay, cool. And then it's like, and then the actual process of starting it up is amazing. It's a rush. I love it. It's like... You know, we're in the middle right now of a, of a uh, uh, crypto and blockchain startup, and it's like, I'm like, it's like a whirlwind romance. You know what I mean? It's like exciting. It's passionate. It's like it's creative. It's it's you know, you want to work 12, 13, 14 hours. You know, so it's really fun. The beginning for me, it's it's always, I don't know. I think the best, because um, you know, and people always say that. You know, it's that journey. You know, so yeah, I would say it's a combination of things. It, it's there's it's a rush, there's uncertainty, there's hope, there's doubts, there's all the elements of you know of of life. You know, um, I mean, how fun would it be to open up a business that you know? I mean, the outcome of every little last thing. I mean, I guess it, to a certain degree that'd be good because if, you know, that means, you know, if, if you know everything that's going to happen and it's going to be financially successful, then it's a good thing. But um, it, it's just, it's awesome to have uncertainty and to not know, you know, all the outcomes, you know, and, and, and to play the game because ultimately it's a game. Okay, that you know, we we started making some money with that, but I didn't like. There was a lot of chasing going on because we were also recruiting agents. There was a lot of chasing. Um, I want to say I, I consider myself to be a good um, um, storyteller, um, salesperson, visionary, all these different things, and I, I typically find myself. Um, being surrounded by people that um, want or ask of me, you know what I mean? Just like, you know, talking to them. I mean, it can be about anything, you know? Like, it can be about business. It can be about relationships. I kind of find myself in that position where I'm, I'm like start talking to somebody and after a while like hey you know what you know hey thank you very much you know that really I needed that you know I, I needed that conversation or you know what yeah you kicked me in the butt thank you because um, I, I I tend to tell it how it is I always ask people I said hey you want me to tell you what you want to hear or you want me to tell you how it is you know <laughs> and uh, usually I like to tell it how it is you know um, so sorry I lost my train of thought um Life insurance, we're, we're in life insurance. Oh, yeah, so we're chasing, you know, recruiting, all this crap, which, uh, you know, I kind of feel like, hey, you know what, I don't want to chase anymore. I don't want to, like, I know what I can do, you know, and sometimes when I feel that I need to uh, convince other people of what they should do, you know, it's like, yeah, they get excited, and then it's like they disappear, you know, because that's what happens to a lot of people. You know, anytime I do anything, anytime I interview somebody any, for a position, anytime I like proposing a business deal, whatever, I always tell people, look, don't, don't, don't decide here. You know what I mean? You know, think about it. Go, you know, talk to your, 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 your wife, your husband, whatever, because I know how people are. People, you know, get caught up in the moment, get caught up in the mood right then and there, and they're like, yes. And then it's not really what they want. You know, so um, I'm I'm doing life insurance. We're recruiting. We're also selling policies, 
you know, I'm on the radio, I'm on a Haitian radio station. Uh, we, we always had experience with radio advertising and, and infomercials and stuff. So I've always been a marketing guy. Um, and then I was just like, man, you know what? I don't like this. So my buddy Caesar, um, back, uh, he had started a an online printing company called Miami Flyers, and he had another company called SameDayPrinting.com, and he was selling Miami Flyers, and he was opening up a bar uh, by himself, and he told me he was like, hey. I'm selling Miami Flyers, but samedayprinting.com has a lot of potential. I said, yeah, I think it's dope, you know, because I had ordered from it, and it was a small, tiny little company. And he was like, look, let's do this. He was like, I'm going to, if you come on board with me, I'll give you, I don't know, 30% of the company, and you come and run it. I was like, yeah, let's do that, because I love dot-coms. I had seen him, you know, take a business that he started from his garage and it turned into, you know, selling, I don't know, $1.5 million. But I would, I would, I was always obsessed with orders coming in, like two in the morning, five in the morning, like making money while you sleep. So that was a big draw for me. So I, uh, really wanted, um, to be involved in a dot com and, I was presented the perfect opportunity. And I came on board and I started quitting life insurance and I started focusing solely on growing that business. Okay. Um, and that's in Miami. What year is that? All right. So now that is 2010. 2010-ish. Okay. Yep. When did you leave Miami? I left Miami in 2012. Wow. Left Miami to New York City. So, and in, in I had a son in, two, excuse me, I left, no, I want to, sorry, my, my day's wrong. I left Miami in 2013, like uh, in August of 2013. So I had, my, my son was born in, in Miami, and um, my son, his mother, and I, we decided that we were tired of Miami, because Miami is one of those places that it's like, you say Miami, and it's like, oh my God, I love Miami, tell me about Miami, you know, it's, it's, it's fun, it's, it's everything, but when you live there, you, it is fun too. You can party too. You got the beach. There, there's so much to do. It's super cultural. So many nationalities, flavors. You name it. But Miami tends to be. And I don't want to sit here and talk crap about Miami because I love Miami, um, and it's a part of me. And um, eventually, you know, I'll, I'll have a you know a place there as well. But um, the people are not too serious like if we would have been doing this interview there you may have showed up at 12 30 you know what I mean you know who knows you know what I mean like I may have not even showed up I, you know it's kind of like it tends to have you know the island mentality that South American mentality which is like you know yeah I mean like business is you know there's business taking place obviously but it's more like I don't know people sometimes tend to be not super punctual and kind of like take things a little more laid back and I get it you know you're in like surrounded by palm trees you know uh, so uh, we decided we wanted to get out of Miami and we had visited I had always wanted to live in New York City so we had visited New York City prior on just like a three or four day scenario and it was like when we were up there we were like hey yeah you know this is cool, you know, I could, we could see ourselves living up here, you know, we were walking around the Upper East Side, and it was just like, cool, it's New York, you know, so then uh, we decided to move, so the, um, um, it was probably like three or four months, or like two months after um, my son Liam was born, that we moved up to New York City. Yes. Yes. That is a great, you're very observant. And that is a great, great, you know, question. Because 
it is a lot to intake, you know, um, especially with a newborn and especially like new parents, you know. So it was, um, it was challenging. It was fun. It was controlled to a certain degree. Um, I did have a friend who ultimately ended up becoming a business partner that lived in in in, in the Upper East Side where we were moving to, and. Um, I mean, looking back at it, it was kind of crazy, but at the moment, you know, it was like, you know, it wasn't like we were running away from anything bad, um, you know, everything was kind of controlled, you know, I had some money saved up, so it, was kinda, it wasn't like a, you know, it wasn't a scenario where it was like completely wild, but um, it was definitely, you know, a very uh, impactful time in my life, you know what I mean? Just because of, you know, being a new father, you know, being in a new city and, you know, this is not, you know, any ordinary city It's you know, New York city. So, and being in a small apartment, you know, going from having a lot of space to being in a, you know, you know, 600 square foot apartment, you know, for a lot of money. So, um, it was definitely, I don't know. It was, it was, uh, it, it needed to happen, you know, cause I, I'm a type of person. I don't like to live with regrets, you know, and I kind of feel that a lot of things are already written, you know, um, they just need to kind of be fulfilled. And I feel that, you know, a perfect storm came for a New York city move, you know, and we, we did that move, you know? Yes, so I was running same day printing from my apartment um, there, which was kind of chaotic as well, because small apartment, uh, newborn, um, and you know, running a dot com, which is like a baby as well too. You know, requires a lot of attention and everything. I mean, I remember building a gate around my computer. And that way my son wouldn't, you know, because he would kind of want to, want me to grab him and stuff, but sometimes I'd be busy with clients on the phone or whatever. Um, so we were we were running that business, and we also had a, a, a resale business of, um, this was my business partner, um, who ended up investing, not Caesar. So Caesar, we ended up buying out, and then I, I became business partners with um, with a guy, um, a, a very funny and interesting guy um, there. And we had two business houses. So we had samedayprinting.com, and he was in the business of, of, of resale. So he would buy high-end purses um, and, and, you know, anything couture from a lot of, you know, rich housewives from the Upper East Side and other parts of uh, New York City. And he would buy their, you know, their Chanel's, whatever, and, you know, clean them up and then resell them on eBay. So we had that business and, you know, we were buying different things, but it was just kind of like with him, it was like, I kind of found myself, um, wanting to run things a certain way. And he really wasn't on the same page. And it was just kind of like New York just started becoming like dark, you know, just started, um, I don't know, it just started, um, you know, there was, a, I was starting to get the uncertainty feel. We were blowing through a lot of money. The start, you know, same day printing wasn't where it needed to be, you know, as far as numbers, you know. Um, you know, it was a successful website, but it wasn't anywhere what it is where it's at now. So, you know, all that, and then the the, the resale business, the couture business, that that really wasn't panning out, and like things were taking longer to sell, and we had bought a lot of of some some a big lot of of of, of new merchandise, and that was taking forever to sell. So everything just kind of started like, man, this is getting a little crazy. So then it was like. I, I said to my son's mother, I said, hey, we got two options. I said, hey, we can move to Colombia for one year, right? And like have like no stress because in, in Colombia, like, you know, the dollar goes a long way. I mean, you could, you could get a penthouse, you could. Yeah, so I said, we can do that or we can do Atlanta. And that's it. I said, you know, you've, you've, you know, she liked, she liked Atlanta. She had visited Atlanta before and it was like, we had family here because we had a lot of family here and it was kind of like Atlanta was a choice. And I'm kind of grateful for that just because um, it allowed me to kind of like, I feel if we would have gone to Colombia, it would have been more like, 
a timeout thing, like like a breather. Okay, let's refocus. But instead, we just um, moved to Atlanta, one year to the date, literally one year to the date, and um, yeah, exactly one year. Yeah, yeah. And the crazy thing is, we had just signed the lease renewal. It's, 10 days earlier and I couldn't break that. And I said, hey, we couldn't break it. So now we were stuck with an apartment in New York, which, well, I mean, we, we, we left it clean, we left everything. And now it was like, okay, we gotta you know, release it to somebody. So luckily that, that process took like two weeks and we were able to, I mean, I lost some money, but we got at least because in New York, you know, they don't play games, you know, it's like, you know, uh, I've never seen a city like it. I mean, to if you want to get an apartment there, like you got to make, I think it's 40 times or, you know, 80, you know, it's like you got to make like really good money to be able to afford it. You know, it's, it's not like here, you know, here I feel like sometimes, you know, they'll give anybody an apartment, but there's different. And um, yeah, so we were able to, we, we moved here literally one year after and we just drove down and, and when we got here, it was like, okay, you know, you know, everything felt peaceful because Atlanta to me has always felt very peaceful. You know, uh, when I would visit, when I was living in Miami, visiting back, it was like, ah, oh, Atlanta, you know what I mean? Calm, peaceful, you know, family. Um, and that's still what it is. You know, that's one of the biggest things about Atlanta is that it's a big city, but it still feels, you know, it's, it still has its calm, nice, charming thing about it, you know? And so, had your dad moved back to Atlanta hmm. at this point? Uh, so my dad had moved, when we were in Miami, my dad had, he was already retired, and he moved back to Columbia. So he was living back in Colombia, and he would still come and go because my, my parents are dual citizens. They can come and go as many times as they want. Um, my mother pretty much was, when we left New York, she was she was already leaving, you know, to move to Colombia as well. Uh, yeah, well, no, they're, they're separated. So, I mean, they live close to each other. They have a good relationship. Um, so they moved back. Uh, he, she moved back. And then um, they're still there. I just, I was there last week. Yeah, I was there for 10 days and it was my first time my son had gone. So it was just him and, just him and me. Uh, I hadn't been in seven and a half years, so I was slacking. Um, and I went with my son and we had the most amazing time. It was like the band was back together. You know, my mom, my dad, me. Uh, he's five. He's about to turn five in the next couple of days. So we, we had a lot of fun. We saw a lot of family members, you know, and, um, you know, it was, it was great. You know, I can't wait to get back. You know, every time I come back, I'm like, you know, I need to get back more often, you know. <laughs> so you moved to Atlanta in 2014, mm -hmm. moved back. How, how did the city feel? It's been, what, 14 years? Yeah, great, great question. The city had now become a city. When, when I left, it was uh, 98. The Olympics had just happened. But I feel like Atlanta was in a funk. I've talked to other people that tell me the same thing. They were like, I don't know if it really didn't have his identity or what was going on, but I just kind of felt like, I don't know, it, was, it wasn't there yet. Looking at it now or coming back, it's like, you know, so many restaurants, so many different options. Like, it, it, to me, it feels not totally different, but it has grown so much. So for me, the city had matured. You know, I feel that now it could... I won't say that I'll compete, like, food-wise, I think it can, can not, not compete, but, like, to the level of, like, a New York City. You know, you have a lot of food options. There's a lot of, there's a great food scene here, you know, especially on Beaufort Highway. You know, you go down Beaufort Highway, and it's like, you know, whatever you want to eat. You know, you can be anywhere in the, you know, all types of cuisine. So um, I felt that it had now grown up, but still had its you know, it's charm to it, which was great. So I felt like, wow, you know, Atlanta grew up, you know? Did you move back to Beaufort Island? No, well, close enough, Brookhaven, <laughs> you know? Not, not the, the Brookhaven that's closer to, uh, to Blackburn Park area. Um, so when I got here, it was, 
I don't want to say it was starting from scratch, but it was kind of like, you know, I feel like it was another go around where like, you know, I had my butt kicked financially, you know, and it was like, oh, yeah, coming back to Atlanta, it was like, okay, we're here, there's a lot of debt, there's no car, you know, we, 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 uh, we stay with my, my, with my sister and Swanee for about a month. And then, uh, um, you know, moved over to the Brookhaven area. But what I did say when I got here was, I said to myself, Atlanta is for the taking, you know, because I saw so much opportunity here. And to me, I've always been, although I grew up in Atlanta, I think I have New York blood, you know, and I also have obviously the immigrant blood, you know, which is like... You know, somebody else may say, hey, oh, Atlanta, you know, there's there's no jobs here. There's nothing going on. You know, all the good stuff's taken. No, I saw I saw a lot of opportunity here. So I, I literally uh, made made that um, that statement, that affirmation. I said, hey, you know, the, the city's for the taking, you know, and let me, you know, let me do what I have to do, you know. And um, I still had same day printing at the time. A buddy of my Maui, back to Maui, he was still working in financial services from Miami, Miami, who was in life insurance. He says, Kev, he's like, hey, th this Affordable Health Care Act thing is blowing up, you know, Obamacare, you know, we can make 100,000, we can make 150 grand. And I'm like, okay, cool, what do I gotta do? He's like, no, get your license. I said, okay, cool, you know, I get my license, you know, to, to basically, my license in, 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 in Georgia to sell health insurance. Because there was a time when, when, when the Affordable Health Care Act was coming out that it was just now starting to, to um, come out and there was a lot of opportunity because it was new and, you know, so you, you can make a lot of money and all this stuff. So, um, as I'm, so as I'm still working at, you know, with my startup, um, I got licensed and, you know, I got appointed with the different carriers or whatever. And then a buddy of mine, Danny, who's a childhood friend who grew up on Beaufort Highway as well, he was going to join forces with me for us to, he had a moving company at the time, he still does, very successful moving company. This was just a way to, for us to make extra money, you know, so we said, hey, we need to get an office, small office. Yeah, because I can't see those people from my, you know, from where I was staying. You know, I can run a dot com from there. So I said, we started looking for office. We found an office in this building. That's how I came to this building. I had been in this building before, because um, there, the Globe Building. I had been in the building before because a buddy of mine. Um, did some graphic design work for us and he was upstairs and I had came to see him one time but I didn't think anything of it. The building looked different from what it is now. But we ended up finding an office here, a small little closet, closet upstairs, tiny office. And we ended up, you know, we, we took it. So then it was me and my buddy. My, my buddy ended up not getting into into the life, excuse me, into the insurance, health insurance side. And then I was like, look, man, you don't have to continue paying the office. I'll just pay for the office. I'm running same day printing out of here. And, um, and I started doing the Obamacare on the side. You know, it's like a side hustle. No, what I did was uh, I've always been a little, you know, marketing and I don't know, branding wizard type. So I created a brand, did all the collateral in Spanish, English, you know, and then I went to a couple different places, put up some banners, and we were starting to get referrals for people that needed to get enrolled in um, the the healthcare. Uh, yeah, and when we get a paid a commission, you know what I mean? Like, okay, I help you and your family get enrolled in Obamacare. You know, the insurance carrier turns around and gives us money. Or pays us, you know, legally. So I started doing that, and I was, like, working super late and, you know, uh, all these things. And it was just, like, ultimately, like, I didn't even, they didn't even pay us. So it was kind of like, wow, you know. So I, I did, I mean, I maybe did, like, 50 cases, but they never paid us. But I was like, okay, it is what it is. You know what I mean? They didn't pay us. Um, I have same day printing. I'm now focusing on that hardcore. And then I decided to get a little bit of a bigger office upstairs as well. And one thing, 
is you never know who you're going to end up doing business with, you know? And I was always polite and nice to the building owner, you know? Some people want to be jerks to their landlords, you know what I mean? Um, I was nice to him. I would compliment him on his building, although I knew there was a lot of room for improvement, and I thought the building was unique. So I said to him, I said, um, I said one thing that I said to him was, I said, hey, Robert, uh, one day I want to do like a networking event in the atrium. He was like, yeah, man, that's cool, no problem, cool, whatever. So I found myself, same day printing is getting stronger. I now have maybe three, four employees at the time. I have a bigger office. Um, I always had said that I wanted to have an office with a pool table, ping pong, fun things. I had made that affirmation three, four years ago when I got to Atlanta. I said, man, I, I want to buy a building. I want to have an office that's cool, you know, like Google type or, you know, something in Silicon Valley, you know, the fun offices uh, with the unlimited Skittles or M&Ms or whatever. So when I'm in that office, I found myself, it all kind of was like a perfect storm. I once had a guy who called me up and was like, hey, you know, can you can you do a website? I'm like, we're not in that business. And then he was like, no, but I really like your website. So I ended up doing business with him. And then he would come and see me a couple of times. Cause we don't see our clients. Like samedayprinting.com is an online business. And we don't, you know, we're, we're, we're a national business, but we don't see our clients face to face. But him, it was an exception. Then I met this other girl who was a photographer. And then it's like, hey, come work in my office, inside of my office, a small office. I was like, hey, just show up, you know, kind of like that whole thing. Because I feel that I've always been a magnet for entrepreneurs and like vice versa. You know, I think entrepreneurs, you know, they get along so well is because, you know, they're A, crazy, and B, um, they love to talk, you know, and, and, and that's what you do. So I found myself inviting people, right, and then I'm like, you know what? I'm like, hey, I had only been in one co-working space in, at WeWork in um, Soho. I believe it was Soho location. I, I had been, and I thought it was cool. I was like, man, this is cool. And, and in Miami, I had been in one too, but not working, just checking them out. Okay, cool. Um, so I said, let me get a bigger office and let me subsidize my rent, almost all of it or part of it, and let me pick up a conference room, which I didn't have, and let me bring in two other entrepreneurs. Maybe I find an attorney and, you know, a graphic designer or a PR person or who knows. So then I email, I can show you the email, I email the building owner and I said, hey, Robert, how you doing, buddy? Well, like, what do you have in the building? I was thinking smaller, obviously. He was like, I got this, this, this. And then he had this huge space. Uh, it's almost like a half of a building, entire floor. And then we also have space on the other side. So I said to Robert, I said, hey. So he sent me an email with floor plans. And I said, hey, what about this big space? He's like, oh, yeah. He was like, I'll show it to you. I'll show you. I can show it to you on Thursday. That's cool. So I was already thinking co-working space. So... This is before, at that time, maybe there was 10 co-working spaces in Atlanta. Now there's probably like 45, 50. I don't know. There's a lot. So I said to him, we walk in. This was uh, two and a half years ago. So we walk in and we're standing on the other side of that door behind where you are. And we walk in. He says, Kevin, what are you thinking? I said, let's do a co-working space. He was like, okay, let's do that. So we literally walk around, and, and that's why you got to be careful what you ask for because, you know, just by asking, you might get a, a simple yes, you know. So we went upstairs, and we started talking about how we would structure the company. And obviously, you know, uh, Robert is a very smart guy. You know, he did his due diligence. You know, you know, he went and probably started Googling the crap out of everything, co-working. I, I think he told me he bought some books off of Amazon. You know what I mean? Like, he want, he's a real estate guy, and he's very successful. But he had, co-working was new to him. Co-working was new to me. 
you know. People weren't new to me, but co-working was, you know. So I felt that him and I, we could make a very successful business. So he, and I, and I told him, I said, look, Robert, I, you, know, I don't, you know, I don't have the money to put this up. He was like, no, he was like, I'll put the money up. But I said, I'll work it. You know, he was like, okay, cool. So we ended up, um, we ended up um, pretty much um, launching the Globe Hub, which the building is the Globe. We are the Globe Hub. And we currently have 31 offices. We're all sold out of office space. We have five conference rooms. One of this being the large one, we have um, eight private desks. We have a huge atrium for functions. Eight private desks or eight? Wow. No, eight. Eight. Okay. Yeah, yeah, eight quantity. Eight private desks. Uh, we have bocce a bocce ball court out back, looking at overlooking um, airplanes. Jets, helicopters, planes. We have ping pong outside. We have a barbecue grill. We have a lounge. Um, and we're continuing to expand. So to tie back into that, uh, we decided, um, so I still have same-day printing, right? You probably see a trend here. It's like anytime that I have a business, I always look for an offshoot business. And that was this. And I've always liked real estate. You know, I've always liked real estate. And I like people, and I like co-working spaces. So we started, and um, you know, we started. I was the first tenant, same day printing, and then we just started building and building and building and building. And now we have over a hundred members. We have all types of entrepreneurs, women entrepreneurs that are very successful. We have tech startups, we have traditional style businesses, we have a little bit of everything. But what makes us so unique is that we're so diverse, we're from everywhere. So this ties back into Buford Highway, it ties into our name, you know, the globe. You know, we're from, you know, we're from, you know, my business partners from South Africa, my, my new business partner, which I'll, I'll bring him in um, just shortly. Uh, we have people here from Germany, India, uh, Colombia, you know, Bolivia, um, white, black, you name it, everything. And we're very diverse. So, and we're right down the street from Beaufort Highway, you know. And like I said, you know, one of our slogans is like, we speak your language, you know. That could mean your actual language or it could be business, ling you know, business talk, you know, tech talk, many different things. So, and, and we're at an airport. So, th you know, that's interesting too because, you know, uh, there is some international flights that happen here. Um, and, you know, we're, we're having fun with what we're doing, but through this process, because um, I, I, I feel obligated to, to mention my business partner, Vishay, Vishay Singh, um, Tress, which you guys are familiar with, at least Marianne is, um, she, I had met Tress with something to do with same day printing, some business development. He worked for, um, I think UGA has a program for. Trust Crow. Yeah. I think he's one of your donors or something. Um, he and he, um, Tress introduced me to Marianne as well. Um, so I went to go see Tress and he saw what I was doing here and he was like, hey, I need to introduce you to a guy named Vishay. And then Vishay came here and then Vishay is like super entrepreneurs, has bought and sold over 50, 60 businesses. And he came here, he liked it. He decided to move his company here, but then he started helping me with globe activities, with a many different things, because running these type of spaces, are, are, it's hard to do, it's not easy. So him and I became partners, and we're both the co-owners of the Globe Hub, you know. And then, you know, he also partnered in. He invested some money into same-day printing, and he became a partner in that. So we have that together. And then we have a third startup called Block C, which is a crypto and blockchain um, company, you know, different activities in that whole, you know, space. And, um, you know, we're just having fun, you know, like to me, coming to the globe on a daily basis is like, it's not work. It's like, I feel like I'm back in school. It feels like I'm in an environment where I get to meet super interesting people, 
from A to Z, you know, all types, you know, whether it be, you know, a blogger to somebody building a really cool app to a sports athlete to, you know, a very accomplished business person. Uh, the other day, um, I had a chance to meet um, the Airbnb's founder's father, who is, you know, part of the Brookhaven community. And um, I already had said, I wanted to meet him because I heard that he lived in Brookhaven. And the next thing you know, there was some function out there and somebody introduced me to him and it was like, you know, shook his hand and and uh, it was him, you know. Um, not, not the founder, but the founder's father, you know, <laughs> which I think was probably one of the early investors in the company, I hear. But we get to meet people from, from all walks of life and very interesting people. And, um, you know, we're just having fun and we're also trying to help people, you know, grow their startups, their, their visions. You know, we love you high, you know, you guys have been, you know, part, you know, members here for, for quite a while now. And, you know, we support, you know, many different projects, entrepreneurs and, you know, startups. So when you first found your closet on the No, because it was close and it was cheap. Okay. It was close and it was cheap, um, and that was the whole reason. But uh, one thing that I want to say on how things work out is I didn't get paid directly for I, the only reason I got the office space here was for the Affordable Health Care Act, and I never got paid, but I got paid differently. And sometimes as an entrepreneur or just in life, you know, Compensation can come in many different forms, and they can come in, 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 they can come down the road. Look, if it wasn't for me doing the insurance stuff, I never would have um, probably moved to this building, and then all the people that I've met and some of these other companies that have spun off of me coming here. Um, is amazing. So um, sometimes I feel like entrepreneurs, they get really frustrated, you know, when like things don't pan out for them or they're planting seeds, planting seeds and, 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 and watering their harvest and, and nothing's happening and nothing's happening and then they give up when, you know, right around the corner could be that next huge meeting, that next huge introduction that completely changes your life, you know? And um, you gotta have, you gotta have patience uh, with entrepreneurship. And I feel that if I would have just given up, maybe even on the building and just, oh, you know what, nothing's going on here. And like, I just got this office because this, no, I just kind of stayed the course, you know? So I'm, I'm grateful that I did that. And, um, you know, ultimately I was paid um, times a lot, you know, um, when when I was doing the, the Affordable Health Care Act stuff, you know, I was paid in a different way. So in the, when you moved back to Atlanta, you said the city had a different Oh, yeah. So when I saw Buford Highway, I was like, wow. So basically, I saw so many different eating options. So before, on Buford Highway, we had some Mexican, right? Um, some Asian, but not a lot. And then you had your traditional Hardee's, you know, McDonald's, Checker, you know, just the, the fast food stuff. But what had changed was it was almost like the density of so many food options you know like it's not like it's just one vietnamese restaurant right you probably have seven or eight to choose from you know mexican there's you know 10 different ones to choose from you want to eat inside a carniceria you can do that you want to eat at something that looks a little nicer you can do that you know there's so many different levels of it which is nice because it's like each one has its own you know unique feel you know and some of these businesses seem to be like right beside each other you know what i mean and that doesn't stop anything and i also love the the fact of so many bakeries I will say, I say this, I like, you know, I like Sweet Hut a lot. And when I walk into Sweet Hut, if I, if they covered up all the windows, I would feel like I'm in New York City. 
because I see so many different faces, right? The food is really good. And it has that energy, that New York City energy, that feel to it, that diversity, different languages. So that was very refreshing. And um, just visiting some of the other restaurants, how the, how good the food tastes, you know, it's like, and how cheap it is, you know, because it's not expensive. And it's like, wow, you know, this is an awesome meal. And it's like, you're not getting hit upside the head, you know. Um, and then just kind of seeing um, what else. You know, just just some of the new businesses as well. Um, and then how kind of lit up it is, I kind of feel like since there's a lot more going on, you have some um, plazas like that Northeast Plaza, not Northeast Plaza, but that plaza where um, that rolled ice cream thing is in front of... Um, in front of Sweet Hut, like that, that plaza wasn't, it, it almost feels like there's life, like a lot of life is being injected back into um, some of these plazas, you know what I mean? Like a lot's going on. And so when you were, when you would visit Atlanta, when you were living in Miami, when you were living in New York, did you see like each time there was something more, there was something more? Well, sometimes I wouldn't, sometimes I wouldn't, like usually when I would come back to Atlanta, I would be more of like, like little five points was on my to-do list because I love little five points and um, maybe Buford Highway because um, I'm the type of person that I get real nostalgic. Like I still drive by my old apartment, my old apartments like at least twice a year just to do a, uh, yeah, Cambridge Square Apartments. It, it was, to me, it was like the... Hey, okay, I will say this little little um, view high history. Cambridge Square Apartments, right off of Oak Cliff Road, next to Tower Package Liquors. That apartment complex was one of the best apartment complexes on all of Beaufort Highway. Why? There was 50 kids to 60 kids living there. Right? You've seen Stranger Things, right? Well, um, what was the movie? It. Uh, not it, well, the one with Stephen King, but it kind of shows the 80s with, you know, kids on bicycles and, you know, let's build a cardboard box and like let's sneak into the bushes, you know, all that. It was that. And there was like 50, 60 of us. And we were from everywhere. You know, Ethiopia, you know, uh, heavy hit, a lot of Hispanics, you know, a lot of Colombians, Puerto Ricans, some Mexican. Um, but we were from everywhere. And we, that complex, and it was it was like a HUD. The rent was really cheap. Um, but it was, it, it was really, it was nice. But the, yeah, yeah. So our rent was like, $250 for like a three bedroom. And I think it's still, it's probably like four or $500 now. But those apartments, they, there was 50 or 60 of us and it was so fun because it was like, you know, the time when like people played outside and did things outside and like, you know, we had, we were just getting like Nintendos back then. It was just now starting to, like video games are just now starting to come out. So that was um, very impactful and um, and it was right off of Beaufort Highway, you know, and we all, you know, would see each other at the local Kmart, you know, Lionel Play World, uh, you know, Big Star, you know, the, the, the our supermarket, Radio Shack. It, it just had a real nice uh, community feel to it, you know. Yeah. Lionel. So it's L I O N E L. Okay. Lionel Playground. And if you look it up, there's you, you can find a lot of photos just in general of what it was. Um, but it's it's the same. The facade outside looks the same. It's just obviously the inside was ripped out and they put a soccer field in there. Um, so yeah, there, there, there's been a lot of interesting, um, a lot of uh, cool businesses. You know, the Kmart was awesome. You know, me and my mom would go to Kmart shopping, and then they had a cafe inside of Kmart, and they sold like really good like hot dogs, French fries, shrimp. Um, that was nice going there. Um, there was a lot of different restaurants, different than what it is now. There was a good Mexican restaurant called El Chico, which was a Mexican restaurant next to the Tower Package. There was a uh, uh, a strip club for women uh, right beside the Tower Package, uh, which was kind of interesting. Uh, we had the movie theater. Uh, we had um, 
Sensational Subs, which was that crawfish place that has a very, okay. Yeah, so that was Sensational Subs. Awesome subs, like New Jersey style subs, you would get them there. And I would remember going in there because it was, when you would walk in there, usually you would be hanging out at the pool because there was a public pool there. Um, there was baseball. It's kind of where the Dorville Police Station is now. We had baseball fields there. And then up about a little further out, um, back over there, there was a, the, the, it was like the city pool. So like you would go there, you know, in the summer, you'd be at the pool and then you would walk over to Sensational Subs and um, yeah, the landscape is a little different. Does that have the same architecture? Yes, it was. The same yeah, it's, it's beautiful. It's, it's super interesting. Yeah, that was a sub shop, you know. I think it was built as, a, you know, they built it. Um, what else was around there? I mean, El Toro is still there. The Me Mo is that Monterrey? I think uh, Monterrey is still there, the Mexican restaurant. That one's original. That's, like, originally from back in, like, late 70s or early, early 80s. And then, um, yeah, I want to say it's, it's – there, there was diversity, but there was – bigger style like chains like the Kmart, Ridgeway, some bigger supermarkets and stuff like that in, the, in that area. Oh, and there was also in Shambly, forgot a notable mention, the flea market, which is where the um, the other farmer's market is down in Shambly, that new city farmer's market. That whole complex was an indoor flea market, and it was the bomb. It was really cool. Are there certain people from, like, the 80s, do you feel like in the 80s, certain, like, figures that um, influenced you in your memory? From that era... I don't know if you knew that when you were a child. Well, I would say... I don't know if I would say figures. I would say more of what the area was and it just ties into the 80s and 90s um, which you know the 80s you know there's a whole movement of how you know nostalgic are with, with, with that era you know like the 80s everything about the 80s and it was kind of like I don't know it was like a growing up now on Buford Highway I think would feel different but since it was a Buford Highway that was in the, at least when I grew up there, 80s, 90s, which was a really cool era, but then it was starting to transition with all of the immigrants that were coming in, so it had that little bit of international flair to it, but it was like you would get the best of both worlds because you would get that um, Americana feel to it. You know, you'd walk into a Kmart, and it was very kind of like white or whatever but then you'd also have like diversity as well and it was kind of like the merging of two worlds which now it's not like that you know it, it's great what it is now but I feel like it's already merged we saw the merging of it you know, we saw that, that that coming together and really, really blend, blending in. And I want to say there was no resistance. No resistance by, by anybody. Okay. You know what I mean? By the existing businesses, by any ethnicity or whatever race you you know you are it was there was no pushback there was not like hey you know like we you know this is you know this is our area or you know it was just kind of it just started happening you know and it's just it was very well accepted and i think that's why beaufort highway is what it is now is because the they they've easily adapted you know you know, to to everything, and they've also, uh, I think, done a great job of, of, um, of kind of conserving, you know, what it um, what it is now, you know. And then obviously, what you guys are doing with We Love You High is, 
is putting more emphasis on let's let's protect it you know let's keep it unique let's keep it affordable you know let's you know not displace you know the the businesses or families that are there because that's that's just so typical of cities you know what i mean like oh look you know they put up new places oh okay let's do a cookie cutter you know style shopping center you know what i mean and then you're gonna see the same you know crap you see everywhere else you know it's cool you know the way it is oh and another thing is plaza fiesta used to be something called outlet square mall which is a really cool mall and it was not a super busy mall but very good memories they had the rack room there you had the burlington there um you had some other stores but it was kind of like it was called Outlet Square Mall, so it was kind of like an outlet, but then they had, you know, some good food options, and it was just kind of like an alternate mall to, like, a North Lake Mall or a perimeter mall for the area. Okay. So, so with the, like, changing, the merging, um, do you think that, like, the city and county governments have supported it or not, or, like, what has their role been? Um, what I've seen, at least, I, and, I, and I, I speak more for Doraville, um, Shambly, I think, has done an amazing job, and I, I just think Shambly seems to have grown, is growing faster than uh, Doraville, um, but I think that, I, I want to say with with more with more of what you're seeing so so for, uh, he, here's how i kind of analyze things okay so you have buckhead you have brookhaven so i feel like brookhaven is the new buckhead right shambly is the new brookhaven and doraville is becoming the new shambly right and the reason that's happening is because yeah, i've seen this in new york city like we lived on in new york city on 91st and second avenue that's still classified as uh, as upper east side but now like you're seeing like usually when you would start getting up into the 100s it would start getting a little sketchy but now you're seeing like areas of like new york city that the higher you go up so it's almost kind of like i feel like it's crazy that there's you know million dollar homes in shambly that never really existed before you see what i'm saying like shambly borderline brookhaven you know uh rents i mean an apartment in Shambly for thirteen, fourteen hundred dollars that's crazy. You, you would say that back in the day, people would laugh at you, you know? And then now that's probably what's gonna start happening in Doraville to, to a certain degree, because I know there's still pockets that, you know, the rents are not that expensive, but I feel that the, the cities have caught on and they will continue to be open to you know, um, being flexible with zoning and bringing in, um, you know, a lot of developer money. And, you know, typically it's, you know, it's, it's housing, I feel, what is the catalyst for areas to really start, you know, popping, you know. So I do see a lot of transition. Um, I, think Buf I think Buford Highway will make it. And the reason why is, case in point, little five points. Little Five Points has, even though the area around it has really, really blossomed, and even little parts of Little uh, Little Five Points have done that, none of the businesses have been driven out of Little Five Points. Analyze that. They have not raised the rents to crazy numbers, right? You still got the instant shop there. You still got the tattoo parlor there. You still got Wish there. You still got all Junk's Men. You have all these businesses, and... What could have happened? They could have easily said, hey, you know what? You know, Atlanta's popping. You know, all around the area, there's all these type of things. You know, let's bring in, you know, let's bring in Warby Parker and let's charge them 8000 a month in rent. Warby Parker will pay it. You know, I saw them do that in Wynwood in Miami, which is an area that was where galleries were, square footage was super cheap, and now all of a sudden everything is like, 50, that's where my Caesar owns the bar and some other businesses. Now the area is like $50, $60 a square foot, $75 a square foot. The only person that can afford to rent there is a, a brand like, let's say, a Warby Parker that can just say, hey, this store is not going to make any money. It's going to lose money. But you know what? where were all the tourists are. So it's treated like a billboard. So I think that if Buford Highway 
um, you know, studies little five points, right? I think that it will remain affordable, diverse, and will give, you know, will continue to bring a lot of smiles to, you know, the people of Atlanta, you know, um, so I, I think it will it will continue to be what it is, you know, unless you know you 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 get some greedy developers that think that, you know, all of a sudden they can, you know, um, build something new and then all of a sudden think they're going to charge a bunch of rents. I think that will probably backfire on them. I think it's just too dense, you know, to for it to be pushed out, you know. When you say get right, like, would you say, when you say get right, like, would that be a, an image they have of it before they get there or an, ex, you know, an expectation? Um, yeah, I think just like in their understanding of the free highway, what do they have right? Um, I think what they get right would probably just be like the, the tad bit of uncertainty they have going into it, right? Because there is a little bit of like, you know, where are we walking into or, you know, oh, is this restaurant good or it looks kind of sketchy from the outside. But I think they get that part right. But then the part that I don't think they get right is I think they have a certain expectation going in and they probably heard that the food is good, right? But I think they leave with a greater love of it and knowing you know, how cheap their food was and how, like, how good and how cheap it was. So it's kind of like... What was the expectation they had? I think the expectation they had was uh, some uncertainty of not knowing if it's going to be really good or not. Um, because let's face it, you know, when you have restaurants that don't look the prettiest, you kind of sometimes think, hey, is the food really that good? You know, you kind of have that. You know, we, we all, I think we all face that upon walking into restaurants. I've, I've experienced, you know, I've walked into places and I'm like, my buddy's like, no, you got to come to the, you know, the, the Korean barbecue spot in front of uh, Sweet Hut. And I'm like, you sure, bro? And he was like, yeah, yeah, come on. And then it's like, you have a meal and then it's like, it tastes so good, so fresh. And then the bill comes and it's like, what? $18, bro. I, you know, it, I think it's more of that. So I think people... I think people come in with a little uncertainty and I think they they do get that right from a standpoint of kind of like not knowing because it's kind of like visiting like coming to Beaufort Highway it's kind of like you're visiting a, a, another country you know and that's what makes it unique so um, I, I think I think along those lines what I mentioned okay um, what is one thing that you wish people realized about Beaufort Highway I think they need people need to realize that it's not just about coming to one, it's not just about coming to, you know, eat Vietnamese, then getting rolled up ice cream and then rolling out. I think, and, and there is room for improvement, I think the, these, the, you know, the people visiting Buford Highway should also take into consideration some of the other stores around, right? Go walk in and explore a you know, some random shop, you know what I mean, that you may feel a little weird going into, but you may end up buying something really cool. You know, walk in, you know, discover some of the other businesses that are in the area. You know, anybody can, you know, anybody can roll up to Sweet Hut, have something there and roll out and it's done. You know, are they really getting the Beaufort Highway experience? Probably not, because it's just they're just hit. I mean, they're supporting one. They're supporting one place, which is great. And, and I'm not knocking those people, but give some of the other stuff a try. Hey, when you're at, you know, you know, one of these businesses, go into the supermarket. You know, go discover. You know, like that's kind of what I would I would recommend because I know there's a lot of, you know, un, unique. Um, stores as well, and I, and I do think we need more and more of that. You know what I mean? What do you hope that Beaver Highway is like five years, ten years? Ago? I I hope that it Beaufort Highway takes on a China town approach or a Little Italy approach, where you know we're 
little world. You know, maybe it's not Buford Highway. Maybe we need to change the world. You know, excuse me, maybe we need to change the name. You know what I mean? Um, you know, you go to New York City. Let's go to, you know, let's go to Chinatown. Let's go Little Italy. Let's go, you know what I mean? It's kind of like that. It's kind of like a, like its own, um, like its own district. You know, people do it here in Atlanta, like Little Five Points. You know, Little Five Points is like, a thing to do. You come here, you go to Little Five Points, you know, you go to Junk, uh, you go to Junkman's Daughter, Junkman's Daughter, you go to Wish, you, you know, you have a burger at the Vortex, you know, you have, you know, uh, hot chocolate from the Ethiopian coffee shop, you know, you, um, it, it's more of that. So I, I really, and, and I think there is, I almost feel like there needs to be a heart of Beaufort Highway, which I think probably is, probably hovering around I don't know, if you had to ask me what the heart of it would be, would I, I, I treat it like that sweet hut plaza is how I see it. Uh, I don't know how you guys see it, but um, I would just hope that people treat it as a district that needs to be visited. It's a district, you know? Um, and I don't know if you guys ever use that in your communication, like the Buford Highway District. I don't know if that's used, but it needs to be treated because Buford Highway can also be a little vague. So if I show up to Buford Highway and I show up down by the part next to um, Northeast Plaza, you know, okay, yeah, that's Buford Highway. Or let's say I'm down on Buford Highway down by just past Oak Cliff Road where now there's not a lot going on. Then it's like, oh, yeah, yeah I feel like... We need to do a better job of kind of like sh showing where it's at kind of scenario, kind of like marking. And I know you guys have a map and all that stuff, but just kind of marking the boundaries of where it's at that way. And I think uh, I think you guys did a, like a map as well of like what to visit. So I, I just feel like I would hope people, when they come, they're doing multiple stops along the way, like four or five, you know, four or five different businesses. Cause you know, it stretches kind of big as well. You can't like little five points, you can, you know, you can walk, you can park and hit the whole, the whole strip, you know? Um, so it's just more of that. Um, no, we love what you guys are doing. I think it totally rocks. And uh, I mean, I want to thank Marianne for the movement, you know. Um, I mean, this is hard, you know, stuff to do. I mean, this is not like it's a business that, you know, you know, millions of dollars are coming in, you know, as far as a uh, as a nonprofit. Um, uh, I know you guys are growing and, and I just think that what you all are doing is amazing. When I f first met her and she told me about it, I was like, I always feel like, you know, I see Buford Highway and it's like, I don't want to see it to go. Like, yeah, I like, I love it. You know, I grew up here. This is my backyard. You know, I you tell so many stories about it. And it's like, I just hope that, you know, this movement, you know, lasts for a long time, you know, and I think that people are now listening and people are now sponsoring and people are giving back and people are donating their time and many different things are happening. So I'm just happy you guys are, are, are here and, and helping to preserve that, you know, because we don't, we don't want it to, we don't want it to go away because we feel like, you know, it going away is kind of like, you know, Shamley, Dorville, you know, the whole corridor kind of loses essence, you know? Um, who else do you think we should talk to for this project? For this project, let's see, who else could be impactful? And in, in, I would say Carlitos. So Carlitos Morales, he's a DJ. He is Caesar's brother. He has that business with his mother, Las Americas. Las Americas, and he is a DJ, and everybody knows him in Atlanta, like everybody, he's got like a big reach, and he could tell a lot of stories, a lot, a lot of stories about Buford Highway, he's a little older than I am, so he would probably know even more, you know, more stuff, but his mother is a pioneer, you know, she is woman-owned business 
started a business in 1979, 1980 to serve, you know, mostly Colombians, but Hispanics as well. And um, to me, that would be somebody that you definitely want to, you know, reach out to. And I'm sure, you know, he's, you know, I'm sure he'd, he'd you know, he'd sign up for it, you know. Um, and then his mother's in town sometimes, you know, so maybe you guys get lucky and it could be like a, like, you know, a combination, you know, where he comes in and, you know, he, he brings in his mother and, um, you know, she's a, she's a visionary, you know, for the area, you know, and, and what she's created. And like, and I don't know if you've gone or you've been back, but if you go over there, I mean, the food is amazing. You know, the, the breakfast is great. Lunchtime is great. Um, so that's who I would say. So Car, Car, um, Carlos Jr., um, Carlos Morales Jr., 